All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us for our 14th webinar in the Arctos series. Today's topic highlights media in Arctos and will pre be presented by Carla Cicero from the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley, Angela Lynn from the University of Alaska Museum of the North, and Beth Womack from the University of Wyoming Museum of Vertebrates. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly point out some of resources available to you for navigating media and other topics in Arctos, including our handbook that contains documentation and how-tos describing Arctos features and functions, as well as our webinar archives and recordings of all of our previous topics. I want to also mention our next webinar on March 12th at 3 p.m. This will be our second open office hours webinar where we will invite users and people interested in learning about Arctos to drop in and ask any burning questions that you have. Uh, we'll have several Arctos members on hand to answer questions and demonstrate specific Arctos features. We'll also point out some of our favorite bells and whistles and tips and tricks in Arctos that perhaps you might be unfamiliar with and that we find useful. So if you have a question or topic in mind for the office hours webinar next time, I encourage you to click the link below and add it to our office hours Google Doc so that we can have a sense of content to be covered. Um, people found our first office hours useful, and so we'll continue to host these help sessions periodically. And lastly, before we get going, um, below are some quick Adobe Connect tips. Feel free to type questions in the chat box throughout the presentation, and we'll also leave several minutes at the end for Q&A. At that time, I'll remind you also to fill out our one-minute I Did Bio survey so that we can get your feedback on the webinar. And with that, I will turn things over to Carla. Or I guess it's good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. And um, so we have a lot to cover in this one-hour webinar. Um, so I'm going to introduce what kinds of media we have in Arctos, how you can create media, how you can search for media. Um, and then Beth and Angie will also give some examples. And then um, we'll talk about some licensing um, issues at the end. Um, so just to start, first of all, Arctos has over 775,000 media records. Um, so it's, it's a very rich database, not just for specimens, but also for media. Um, and um, Emily mentioned the handbook, so I just want to point that out again. So here's a screenshot of the, or here's the handbook, and if you click on resources, we've compiled um, different um, uh, documents about media in those resources. So it's kind of a quick guide to, to the documentation pertaining to media. OK, so I'm going to talk about the kinds of media that are in Arctos. And I'm going to start with specimen images, because that's um, pretty fundamental. So um, Arctos has a lot of, of specimen images. Um, here's an, this is an example of a California condor egg. Um, and if you, so here's the egg record in Arctos. This is a Museum of Vertebrate Zoology specimen. And if you scroll down, I've got my screen enlarged, you'll see that these, it's got two media objects attached to it. One is an image of the egg itself, and the other, which I'll, I'll show a little bit later, is the original scan data slip. Um, the media, most of the media, or all of the media in Arctos, are stored at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, which is where the Arctos data are stored. And so if you click on that image, it'll take you, you can see this URL takes you to the TAC server, um, where you can, uh, it's a, a JPEG, but we also have the high resolution images there as well. Um, OK, another type of, um, uh, oh, this, so this screen shows the same thing, but actually from the media search page. So you can get at media, and I'll talk about this a little bit later both from the specimen search um, interface and also the media search interface. So this basically shows the same information, although it's got a little bit more information about the media. Um, OK, so here's another example. So this is another uh, MVZ specimen. This is a hummingbird. And <clears throat> the media object in this case is a CT scan um, that was entered as a media. And um, it's actually a scan that's at the um, 
Digimorph uh, library. So if you click on that link, it'll take you not to the TAC um, archive, but to the Digimorph archive. Um, but it's, it's actually embedded as a media object within ArcDoc. Um, we also, it's, it's also very easy to link out to other sources through other identifiers. So this is the ArcDoc basic specimen search page. And if you search other identifier type for MorphoSource, so that's another repository for CT scans, um, right here, and click search, it'll get you to um, 11 specimens in ArcDoc that have MorphoSource records. And if you click on the first one, which is a herb specimen, um, here's the MorphoSource identifier, which will link out to the MorphoSource record. And you can see that there's a link back to the, in, to the uh, herp record in ArcDoc. So that's, that's pretty handy. And, and that's something that still, these, this relationship with MorphoSource is still being developed um, as part of the OVERT grant. Um, so there's still some, um, some, some development going on there in order to automate that process a little bit better. Um, OK. Um, just some other examples of specimen images. So this is, um, so ArcGIS also has cultural collections. Um, and so this is an example from the University of Alaska collection. It's a willow root basket. Um, so here's a specimen record. And here's four different um, photographs of that. And again, if you click on the image, it will take you to the University of Alaska repository at um, TAC, as opposed to the MVZ repository at TAC. Um, the beautiful images with some labeling and, and um, ruler bars and things like that. Um, OK, so I mentioned um, the scan. So this is, a, um, again, a TAC, but this is the uh, original data slip for that California condor egg um, that I showed you. So. Um, really nice information that's not represented in the specimen record. Um, but so we've got also got some other great examples of um, documents associated with um, specimens. Um, so in this case, this is a uh, University of Texas at El Paso um, uh, paleo collection. It's a fossil horse. And if you scroll down here, you can see an image of the specimen itself. And then you can see that it was tagged in media. And if you click on that, you'll see the catalog of this specimen. And here's that specimen and um, tagged and referenced back to the actual Arctos record. So again, you can create these reciprocal linkages between specimen records and things like catalog ledgers. Um, Another example of that is the host parasite. So the Museum of, of, uh, of Southwestern Biology had a grant to catalog the Robert L. Rausch collection. And so um, <clears throat> this is a page from their ledger. The boxes are a little bit off because I had to enlarge the screen for viewing in the webinar. Um, but it's a similar sort of thing where you can tag the, doc the document and link it directly to a specimen record. Um, so in this case, it goes to a University of Alaska bird specimen. OK. Um, another <coughs> kind of, um, neat thing about Arctos is the ability to link these records to correspondence. So in this case, this is an MVZ um, mammal. It's a grizzly bear. And there was a lot of interest in this grizzly bear um, because uh, and you can see that this specimen was used by a couple of different projects on California grizzly bears. And so we've, because of that and because of the use of our correspondence files, we scanned and uploaded the correspondence and, and linked it to the record. And here's a letter um, from Joseph Grinnell to Mr. R.S. Wellman. Um, <clears throat> talking about the specimen and about the, it actually has to do with the, um, the last grizzly bear that was shot in Yosemite National Park. Um, 
Another example is linking things like media, including documents, to accessions. And accessions in Arctos, and we've, we've talked about this before, but accessions in Arctos can be public or private. This particular example, it's a public accession. This is uh, also from the University of Alaska Museum. And um, again, you can see that here, here's the accession record with the information about that accession, and here's media um, associated with the accession. Um, so here's a letter um, showing that this material was transferred to the University of Alaska Museum in 1990. Um, and if you, um, and here's the public accession record. So it shows, again, those same um, documents and then a bunch of other images associated with um, that accession. OK, another <clears throat> other types of photos that are in Arctos um, include field photos. So we have a lot of photographs of people. This photograph is, a, is an example of a historical photograph in our archives. Um, so this is a field expedition with Joe Grinnell and others in 1910. Um, and but we also have some other really cool um, more recent photos, such as this one of Jim Patton in Peru in 1968 taking field notes on one of his uh, expeditions down there. And then we also, you can also associate um, images with landscapes and habitats. So here's an example. This is another example of an egg record. And um, we have it's a sandhill crane from Modoc County, California. And here's, a, again, an image of the egg. Here's the original scanned data slip. And then we have these two historical images showing the eggs um, in the nest, in the field, um, and also and taken in 1931, um, and also the sort of the broader landscape. Um, in which the, the, the specimens were collected. OK. Um, OK, here's, yeah, here's another great example. So in addition to just being able to upload the images, you can also actually relate images to each other. So in this particular case, these are two images that were taken in Strawberry Canyon in the Berkeley Hills at different time periods. And so this one here um, was taken in 1899. And it's related to this image, which is basically a retake of that image taken in, uh, let's see if I can, in 1935. So you can look at that and see how the, how the vegetation has changed over time. And, and so that's another nice thing about, about Arctis is the ability to relate these images to each other. In addition to images, there's a lot of other types of media in Arctos, um, including audio and video. And so I'm going to give some examples of bird songs. And then I will shit, right, did I? And then I will um, mute my mic and turn it over to Angie, who will uh, give some other examples of oral histories and performances. So uh, we have a lot of, of sound recordings in Arctis, um, mostly of birds, um, but we also have some other things like amphibians. And so this is a, a record in Arctis of a spotted toey. And if you scroll down here, you'll see the recording. So this is an MP3 um, format. And if you click on that, <clears throat> You'll see the MP3 format. You can also see, again, like images, that you can relate audio to each other. So in this case, the MP3 is related to the original WAV file that was uploaded. So the recording was made in a WAV format, uploaded, and then converted to MP3 so that you could listen to it in a browser. But you can still access the higher resolution. And it has a lot of information about the recording itself. Um, who, who recorded it, but also how many songs there are, and its own catalog number, and things like that. And I'll just pay uh, a little bit of it 
so you can kind of listen to it. Eight. So you can play these in Arctis. Right. Um, and so so that's that's pretty neat. And that's something that that's you know fairly recent um, that was added as part of a grant that I have. Okay, I'm gonna continue to navigate, but turn the sound over to Angie, who's going to talk about um, oral histories and historical items in use and performances. Great. So one of the things that we've started to experiment with uh, for our ethnographic and historical collections is linking uh, to interviews and uh, other kinds of media associated with our objects. Our objects are mostly important because they're associated with people or particular historical events. So this is a record for an automobile that's in our history collection. It's the first automobile that was in Alaska. It was created by Bobby Sheldon. And so this is the record. And you can scroll down. You can see a photograph of the object, the, the um, automobile on exhibit, but you can also then see that we've added this audio recording. So if you click on the media details, like uh, Carla did on the last one, this pulls up uh, the MP3 file that is um, actually part of uh, the UAF uh, library's oral history collection, and it's found in the catalog itself. And there was a question about linking out to external websites, and that'll be my next, next example. But with this one, you know, this is an hour-long interview. You can see we've added the original identifier because this is held uh, by another institution. And so you can scroll to just the middle of the recording there, and you can hear Bobby Sheldon, the maker of this, this item, talking about uh, you know, how, why he made it and, and some of the funny stories uh, associated with it. Maybe we can hear it. Oh, Carla, you're on mute. Okay. But she finally married the boss. Her own rotor into the gold field, and after shoveling a few hundred thousand dollars into the back end of the buggy, driving right back home again, and really lifting the mortgage and marrying the Schoolgirl sweetheart and living happily together ever after. That's <laughs> a great way to really show some, um, you know, great historical context associated with these objects. So another way that we can uh, do this is um, some of our items are actually um, things that are used and performed. I don't have an example of a performance, but I do have an example of a, a historical item in use. So this is a steering wheel from a, a sternwheeler that ran on the interior rivers of Alaska. It's called the Alice. And we have, uh, for the media for this one, you can, of course, we have got the, the photograph of the wheel itself. But we've been able to find um, some film footage that was curated through the Alaska Film Archive, again, here at UAF. So you can click on the media details, or you can click right on the image. And then, uh, again, you can see the original media identifier and the information about that film footage. And then you can click on the, the film footage. And um, while we're scrolling through and, and waiting for um, the part to show up, I made a thumbnail for that, um, for that image or for that film footage and made it the, a screenshot of the scene that actually shows. Go ahead and click on play on the image there. Um, the, the scene that shows the steering wheel in use. So this is a, a silent film that is in our film archive, and it shows two of the stern wheelers um, on the river. And as it scrolls through and, and shows life on the river, what it's like, it'll actually eventually get to the, the wheelhouse of the Alice. That's it coming up there. And um, and this actually, I've tagged this, this um, particular media and related it to both the, the steering wheel for the Alice, which is right there. You can see the steering wheel in the, in the wheelhouse. And then I've also related it to the steering wheel for the General Jeff Jacobs, which we have in the collection as well. So a single piece of media 
can be associated, there it is again, um, can be associated with multiple records just with the click of a button. I'll hand it back to Carla. Cool. That's really neat. Um, OK, so now we're going to turn it over to Beth, who's going to talk about research re created with specimens, including art pieces, scientific illustration, reconstruction, scientific use of media, things like that. So Beth, take it away. Hi, guys. So um, some of what I'm going to talk about is sort of, I think, what some of us hope that happens when we put media online for some of our collections, that somebody uses it. So the first example I'm going to show you is, is what happens when you use the scientific use of media. So the MVZ has um, this fantastic egg uh, photographic collection of photographs uh, of all of their eggs. And what happened, actually, was um, Mary Stoddard uh, published, uh, took those photographs and published um, an analysis of them. So Carla, if you, uh, you can see here the project that Carla created for Mary Stoddard about the evolution of egg shape variation in birds. And if you click on that, that'll take you to the project page. And then that has a description of what she wanted to do with that. And if you scroll down, you'll see that there's actually media that was created with this project, including text, the actual publications, images they created for it. But then if you scroll up a little bit, you'll actually see there's 13,049 cited specimens. And um, if you dig more into that, I selected one that's close to my heart, because it's a, of an American kestrel. Um, also, just so, to add to this, um, I, I, some of these other media that are linked to it are, are news articles and national public radio and things like that. So, um, OK, so yeah, here's the egg. So if you um, dig into those specimens that are linked to the project, you can actually see that. So here's the Falco Sparvarius Sparvarius American Kestrel egg. And if you dip down in the record in Arctos, you can actually see their original, um, the image that the MBZ took and put online for it. And then if you go sort of midway up the record, um, you can see the link again back to the project. Uh, so this is uh, media that the MVZ created, put online, and somebody actually used for a scientific project that then created media, and it's all linked together in this amazing web. So the scientific use of media, um, I think this is going to become a lot more prevalent as we p continue to put more of our uh, media online for people um, to access. And then another way I think we can think about scientific use of um, media that's created is um, for scientific illustration. Uh, so a lot of us have people who come into the collections, and they're looking to use uh, our specimens to create a scientific illustration, either for a publication or potentially for uh, education. So for this, this is one of the uh, University of Wyoming Museum of Vertebrates skeleton um, records. So this is a red-tailed hawk. And if we scroll down so we can see um, there's all the info about the red tail, uh, for who prepped it and everything. But then there's media attached to it. And this media was actually created by one of our volunteers. And um, you'll see this is a scientific illustration that's actually a labeled uh, anatomy drawing that actually hangs in our lab for our preparators. Um, and Francis Ngo uh, created this specifically for uh, the lab to be able to understand which bones were um, present as we were prepping. Uh, so again, a scientific use of um, media created by the specimens and linked to the specimens. And I love all this, this interconnection we can do. Um, so another area that's art in research, um, we all have had artists that come into a collection. And I want to think about um, they create projects and pieces with our specimens. Uh, and I want us to think maybe a little bit broader about when we think about research. So there's definitely always the scientific areas. But artists also create, essentially, research um, pieces. They're just not necessarily the science side of it. It's an interpretation of the specimen. So for this one, uh, this is uh, the record for um, 
one of our uh, bears in the University of Wyoming Museum of Vertebrates. And if we zoom down, we'll see there's media attached. And this is not a uh, specimen photograph. Instead, if we take a look at the media details for it, um, this is actually, uh, and we see there's a title for it. This is the wet plate photographic artwork um, created with the specimens. And it's tied in, created by the agent Bailey Russell, who is a photographer associated with a project. And you'll actually see um, there's two different specimens tagged in this media. And if you click on the media, um, actually on the image, um, you can see that there's both uh, the Ursus arctis and the, uh, the deer together. So what the artist was thinking of was creating wet plate photography, which is an old-fashioned form of photography. And he wanted to use our specimens to create juxtapositions between the predator and the prey. And so a different form of research created, um, and it allows us to showcase uh, maybe these other uses of our collection, so not just scientific, but used by other people. And then also is another way for Bailey Russell to actually exhibit his pieces, um, so connecting in and bringing him into the circle of what the museum does and forming sort of those relationships and collaborations. And then the third area I want to talk about um, is reconstruction. So this is um, where you create essentially the animal, um, a reconstruction of the animal or the piece, um, but it's not the actual specimen. So uh, the one example we have in University of Wyoming is we had uh, some people who actually created felt birds uh, so we brought out a bunch of our uh, actual specimens, and they used um, cloth material to create them. So this is a western tanager, and if uh, Carla clicks on the image, you can see um, the entire uh, organism is actually made out of uh, cloth. Um, and But if you back out of the image and then you click on the specimen, you can see the actual uh, organism, the specimen that inspired this image and that it was based on. Uh, so again, this is another form of art, but there are um, some scientific uses that can come in uh, to creating. So here's, the again, the Western Tanager, um, all his data, his info. Here's actually two different pieces of art that are associated with it. One's a reconstruction in felt, and the other is a, a piece of um, a painting that was created. Um, but there are reconstructions that are scientific as I was saying, and uh, I don't have any examples of these, but I'm sure we're going to get them soon, especially as our paleo collections continue to put more uh, media on board, as well as um, some of our uh, cultural collections. Thinking about molding and casting the specimens, if you've ever had somebody who's come into the collection and done a mold of teeth or um, uh, a soft part feature in a wet collection, we could now take either scans or photographs of those molds um, and our reconstructions and put them into Arctis and link those to the specimens. And then um, Angie actually uh, mentioned to me another idea about reconstructions and, of animals and cultural objects. Um, it can be used potentially for some artists as training material. And so if you end up uh, being gifted a portfolio of an artist, sometimes those reconstructions of an original piece or uh, potentially of an animal um, can be in that portfolio. Um, and then I want to mention you can, some people do art inspired by cultural objects and art. Uh, that one you want to be careful, not recommended to create a reproduction of the object. Uh, think about intellectual property rights, especially when you're thinking of cultural um, objects. Um, but they can also be used for study and for education. If you want to have a piece where people actually handle and touch something, um, I'm sure a number of us have had uh, 3D printer uh, discussions with um, some of our educators about producing small um, reproductions for educational use so people can handle them. And that's it for me. <laughs> Back over to Carla. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thanks, Beth and Angie. OK, so I'm going to talk about how to create media in Arctos and how to search for media in Arctos. And, um, this is our media um, search interface. And one of the things that I want to emphasize is that um, <clears throat> there's lots of different ways of actually dealing with media in Arctis. Um, but media can be related to 
um, structured data, such as agents in the database, collecting events, projects, we've seen examples of that, cataloged items, we've seen examples of that. So those are all structured, um, and also accessions, but those are structured types of data in Arctis. Um, and then separately, our media labels, which are more free-form text fields, um, which would include things like descriptions and things like that um, that aren't structured, per se, um, by tables in Arctis. Um, so for creating media, you can do it through either stored files. So we can upload files to the Texas Advanced Computing Center. We currently have about 10 terabytes of media storage there. Um, we're not actually paying for that right now. Um, and so you can, you can store it on a server and link to it that way. You can also, um, as we've shown, link out to other um, sources, such as other media repositories. Um, so YouTube, Project Jukebox, um, different library catalogs like the UAF one that Angie showed, Morphosource, Aave 3D. So it's easy to basically create media to any URL, whether it's on a, a web server somewhere that, that you've uploaded it, or to an external repository. Um, media right in Arctis are public, um, so basically, <coughs> uh, unlike um, so, our, our data in Arctis for the most part, um, each collection has its uh, you know control over its, over its own data, but there are shared types of data, including things like agents that shared taxonomy is shared. So media is also a shared type of data in Arctis. However, we are working on getting and trying to get some secure storage um, so that we can upload certain types of media, such as permits, for example, and put it into a secure repository that, that's password protected so it wouldn't be just publicly available. Um, you can upload media in all different kinds of formats, so either low or high resolution. Um, and as, as we've seen, if you upload them in high resolution, you can then convert them to lower resolution for web viewing, um, and also uh, lower resolution thumbnails, things like that. OK. Um, you can um, uh, <coughs> upload and create media individually, or you can do it through a bulk loader. So from this media search page, you can see this link, Attach Upload Media. So basically, if you click on that, you can either drag and drop it, um, <clears throat> and then you can add your URL, your URL. So that's going to go to wherever the media is. The preview URL, that's a uh, thumbnail um, link. And then choose the media type, whether it's an audio, an image, um, a video, a text, um, some, like a PDF, things like that, and the MIME type. These are all controlled uh, vocabularies. You can select a license, um, and, we're, and Angie's going to talk about licensing later, so like a Creative Commons license. Um, created by agent, so that would be who created the media, a description, and the date it was created. And in this particular uh, place, you actually can't associate the media yet with a relationship like a cataloged item. So you would create the media first, and then edit it to associate it. However, if you're doing it from the specimen record, you would basically get the same window, except that it would already have the relationship filled in, um, shows cataloged item. And um, the same for uh, projects or um, accessions. You can create this. So this is sort of sprinkled throughout Arctis for different uh, places where you can create structured relationships to the data in Arctis. Um, so that's if you want to do it individually. Um, <clears throat> you can also bulk load media. So we do that a lot, where we'll upload a lot of media to TAC through, um, through a secure FTE protocol. And that's all in the documentation. And then you can um, um, use one of these batch tools. You can also upload images to a batch tool. And then you can bulk load media metadata through the batch tool. So basically what that does is it allows you to <coughs> create a, a metadata, a, a data template, bulk loader template, just like we would do for specimens. But this is for media that would have the URLs for the 
the image or the audio recording, the preview, and the basic um, information about the media description, um, a relationship to a specimen um, or to a person, things like that. So you can bulk load or you can do it individually. Let's see. Um, okay. And then for searching, there's also a couple different places where you can search media. So I'm on the media search field. So if you go to Arctis search, you'll see media documents. So that's how I got here. And um, you can search by relationship. So um, created by agent. So I'll do it here. Created by agent um, James L. Patton. So that's Jim Patton um, from. Peru, that's where that uh, field photo was taken. And if you do a search there, <clears throat> hopefully, it, there we go. Um, so there's 683 images. And I didn't select a media type, but you can limit your search to audio or, or image or things like that. I just selected all. I just left it as all media. You can see there's 683 records. Um, of images taken, or of media taken by, um, created by Jim Patton in Peru. And so this is what the result set looks like. You can download it. You can map it. A lot of these are related to collecting events, so they, they're mappable. And you can just scroll down. You can click on, um, you can see what the license is. Um, you can click on any one of these, and it'll get you over to the TAC. And it provides, um, information about the collecting event. It's associated with a specific project. Um, <clears throat> here's some um, more sort of licensing or norms of use information. Here's the description. Here's our own media identifier. And then in our case, we have a subject that we use, so people camp or, or habitat, things like that. So that's one way of searching for media. Um, Okay, and then another way is to search through the, the main specimen search page. So if you search through the media search interface, you're going to get all media um, within those search parameters, not just ones that are associated with cataloged items. So you'll get everything where it shows, you know, it's just a photograph of a person or it's a landscape, as well as images or media associated with specimens. If you search through the specimen search interface, then you're just going to get media associated with cataloged items. And the cataloged item may be a specimen, or it may be an, a cataloged observation. So for bird recordings, for example, we don't necessarily have specimens for all of those. So we've created observational records. We've cataloged them as observational records in Arctis and then associated those observational records with the audio recording. Um, and so you would do basically the same type of search that you would do for a specimen. So I'm going to do Vireo Columbias. Um, and here I'm just going to select, uh, if you scroll down, media type, I'm just going to select audio. Um, but again, you can search on any kind of media. And if I do that search, so this gives me 134 specimens. So pretty much the same type of result that you would get from a standard specimen search, except that you can see that all of these have media associated with them. And if you click on the media link, it will get you to the media detail page, which again, where you can play the recording. Um, here it's linked to the specimen and has more information about the media object itself. Or you can click on the specimen, get to the specimen record. And, um, and then if you scroll down, you'll get to the media the same way. And you can see, again, this is project information and all of the basic standard specimen detail information. Um, so I think that's it for that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Angie, who's going to talk about licensing um, licensing of media. So let me stop sharing. OK. 
Okay. So I am going to talk to us, uh, to our group, about the, the real fine you know, detail or the, the, the basic elements of a really big category of, of rights that are known as intellectual and cultural property rights. So Arctos handles a lot of different kinds of information and media, and, and there are certain laws and ethics that users of Arctos um, operators should inform themselves about so they can best protect their data and the rights of the individuals who actually collected, made, contributed that data, and that includes the media. So intellectual property is a category of law that, that generally encompasses four elements in the United States. And, and copyright law is, is nation dependent, so different countries are going to have different copyright laws. So for the U.S., we have copyright, we have trademark, we have patent, and trade secrets. And cultural property is a special kind of intellectual property that, that doesn't fit the sort of standard intellectual property laws around the world. But these are, this is property that's considered to be important or significant to a particular group of people. And, and that might include actual property, artifacts, and works of art, or it could even be intangible cultural property or heritage. And those are things that are more like um, performances and, and traditional knowledge. And, and we can actually document that uh, in Arctos, in our records, in different ways. So um, this is just our general page about data licensing and use. Um, with some good links down at the bottom um, to kind of give you some background information about data versus media. In Arctos, we have um, a code table. We have code tables for a lot of different things to help us control the vocabulary um, that we're using. And for media, we have licenses or permits that allow us to use other, let others use our data or our media um, that's delivered through our, our collection management system. So when you look at this code table, you're going to see a bunch of uh, codes that are listed here under the license, and, um, and then these, these terms, and then these links over here in the URI column. So some of these will link out to statements on, on people's websites about the conditions of use, um, some of them are going to take you directly to Creative Commons licenses to, to define what those are. Um, and then um, some of them are, are um, going to take you to places like the Library of Congress. So these are, this is a required step when you upload media. You have to select a media license. And, um, and so I'm going to give you a little bit of information about um, what copyright uh, is and, and why we have to think about it when we're um, uploading media. So this is the website for copyright. Copyright is the legal recognition of, of this special kind of, of property rights that are given to creators of quote unquote original work that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So uh, it's intended to encourage the creation of original works by giving that creator this bundle of exclusive rights. So you can see from the, the copyright page that there, this is a very complicated law, and uh, it's not something that's um, you know, easy to really understand with a few bullet points. But the basics of it is that the modern law was passed in 1976 and um, it went into effect in, um, on January 1st, 1978. And that law provides the creator the exclusive right to certain things, so their right to reproduce, to distribute copies, to prepare derivative works, and for some works, the right to display publicly or perform their work. So copyright is not something that is, um, stands in perpetuity. It has a start and an end date. And those dates are part of what is complicated about the, United, the law in the United States. Um, another complicated element is what constitutes an original work. In general, ideas are not protected, but it's the expression of those ideas that's protected. And, and they're protected from the moment of creation. So there used to be a regulation where if it was before a certain date, it had to be published, quote unquote. Um, now, if, if, you know, if, if I make something um, and it's original expression of an original idea and I fix it in a certain medium, then, then I own the copyright on that. And then I get to decide what gets done with it. 
So the general duration of copyright for a single author, it's the life of the author plus 70 years. So that's a long time. Um, there are some um, complications for these items that were made prior to 1978, and um, I'm not going to go into them here, but uh, I recommend if, you know, if this is something that you're interested in and, and you decide that you have a lot of, um, of items that might uh, that you need to, to know about this, that, that you do your homework and, um, and figure this out. So there are lots of websites out there that have resources to help you. Um, Stanford has this great uh, set of charts and tools from their library. Um, is it still in copyright? Um, this is a really important thing uh, to understand. Now, there's also uh, a key set of limitations um, to that legal protection that probably most people are, are familiar with, and that's called fair use. And this is technically a legal defense that allows for the use of copyrighted material without express permission. So it allows for purposes uh, such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, and that includes multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship, or research. Archives and libraries have a certain um, uh, 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 exemption under the copyright law that allows um, that material uh, to be used, um, copyrighted material to be used in their spaces and be distributed. And museums are trying to be included with this, this broad exemption category. So there's probably going to be some changes that are going to be coming um, along the pike with that. Um, again, Wikipedia, a great place to learn some more about copyright, the purposes, um, what kinds of works are subject to it. So some of our photographs, of objects, uh, especially if you have an art collection, those may be considered a derivative work. Um, we may have sound, you know, well, these oral histories, these are sound recordings, and the person who uh, is the subject of those is the, the owner, for, you know, the owner of that, that intellectual property. And so you have to get release forms um, for, for using those. When we use things like at the oral history program here at UAF, those releases have already been obtained by those, those archives and those holding institutions. So that's a really nice way of being able to link those together, and, and you don't have to worry about dealing with the copyright. Now, assuming you are the copyright holder, and copyrights can be transferred between the original creator and, and, and other people, um, you can give others permission to use that copyrighted material, and you do that by issuing a license. Uh, this can be an exclusive or a non-exclusive license. If it's an exclusive, you're the only one who has the right to use that. Uh, a non-exclusive license is anybody can use it, or multiple people can do that. And a lot of public institutions are, are starting to use this most non-exclusive of all licenses known as Creative Commons. And Creative Commons is technically a nonprofit that has created and distributes and encourages the use of their licenses um, that you can assign to your media in order to signal to users that you uh, want them to distribute it, you want them to use it and share it, um, but that you have some restrictions that you want to apply to that. So sometimes you'll see all rights reserved on, on a, a photograph or something online. Well, these are some rights reserved. So that's the deal with, um, with Creative Commons. So you can see there are these codes, CCBY, CCBYSA. So these all uh, connect to a definition that, that gives you um, more or less control over um, what you tell people that you want them to do with that. Um, we use the, the most restrictive, um, for, for our pieces, we use the CCBY and CND. So this means you have to give attribution to where you got that. If I download a photo, um, save it out of Arctos, um, I have to, if I'm going to use it someplace, I need to say where I got it. Um, I need to not try and make money off of it. And I can't change it and, um, and, and then try to pass it off as, as my own. So uh, we want people to share it and, and exchange it and use it in their research and, and in various um, you know, even social media, but we want them to always link back to the source of that information. We call that the downstream use of media, 
and um, it's becoming really complicated and challenging and and this is a it's a fascinating subject um, but it's uh, you know it's something that people need to be aware of and understand what you're doing when you post media online if you have cultural collections uh, in your museum or if you're working with cultural collections you might start hearing about some other labels um, called traditional knowledge labels. And this is something that's really important. We don't use this yet in Arctos, but I'm actually going to be bringing it up so that we might start thinking about it. But these are labels that have been established to help um, respect and, and show uh, that indigenous communities may have special restrictions or permissions associated with um, the objects themselves or photographs or recordings uh, that relate to those those items and and the community may have special restrictions with, and they don't want people um, who are not part of their culture or are initiated to certain communities um, using those so you can see this is uh, a, we a website called localcontext.org um, and these are some of the traditional knowledge tags that people are starting to use to show that um, media means uh, different things to different people and um, and this is one way that we can be respectful and collaborative in how we are um, labeling the media that we have in our collection um, so that's about all the time I have I just wanted to briefly go through um, uh, these elements and um, but I will say there are a couple really important references that you can uh, used to learn more about this very complicated area um, of legal and ethical issues. So Rights and Reproduction is a handbook for cultural institutions. Uh, Hot the Presses with the second edition. Uh, Ann Young is um, the, the person who really knows a lot about rights and reproductions and, and how putting this material out there on the web um, may implicate you for certain responsibilities. So I highly recommend, and I'll, I'll put the links to these um, references in the chat box in just a second um, so that's an important one and then of course something that we should all have on our bookshelves uh, the legal primer on managing museum collections the third edition uh, the classic by Marie Malaro and updated by Ildiko de Angelis um, so that's a really important there's a great section on on copyright and licensing in there as well uh, and then lastly I just want to let people know about another if you're interested in this and going a little deeper or you're fascinated with this concept of copyright and cultural collections uh, there is a connecting to collections care webinar that's going to be happening later in February and look at that it's taught by Ann Young who we just saw um, for the other publication and this is going to talk about some of these complicated issues revolving around um, the use of this media online and these licenses that we're um, putting on things and the different restrictions that exist for uh, different kinds of collections. So um, that's what I've got to share and I'm going to um, hand this back over to um, Carla for wrapping up and um, if I can get out of my screen here. So. Maybe Emily or somebody can force me out as a, as a user. <laughs> there it is. Um, so I think Emily is gonna. Are you gonna un? Uh, let people ask yeah, questions so, now. Yep. So um, we have come to the Q and A portion. So I just actually enabled all of your microphones if you'd like to ask a question. So if you do want to speak. Um, just make sure that you enable your microphone. So if you navigate to the top of your screen um, to that microphone icon, just turn that green and we'll be able to hear you. And you can also feel free to type your questions in the chat box as well. Thanks, everyone. That was great. Right. So we did have one chat question. And Marielle kindly provided a link in Arctos um, as an example. But you can basically link out to any place that has a URL. So if you have photos on iNaturalist or something like that that you want to um, link to your specimens in Arctos, it's very easy to do that. Anybody else have any questions? 
I do, but I'm trying to find something here. <laughs> um, it's concerning um, media. I think it's it's where you have locality unknown, and we've been it's been pulling in media or photos that have localities that are unknown that are being associated with those records, and I'm just wondering what can be done to alleviate that. Yes, we actually have a GitHub issue for that. Um, we need to do some data cleaning, um, but we realize that that is an issue. So basically, um, what's that? It's being worked on. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, it comes up repeatedly. In fact, I was going to bring it up again at the working group meeting this week because <laughs> well, it I just came up again. I happen to notice it because we have a lot of places that have locality unknown, so we get a lot of those pictures pulled in. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure that, you know, no, we're aware of it. We have a GitHub issue for it. We need to do some, yeah, some data management cleaning. Um, okay. So. Oh, good. Thank you. Sorry. Just, yeah, be patient with us, but we'll take care. <laughs> we'll take care of it. But it is, yeah, like I said, it comes up repeatedly. So, um, yeah, and just to say the flip side of that. So, um, yeah, so those media maybe were like landscapes or habitats associated associated with a collecting event. Um, so, like the, in the example that Carla showed of Strawberry Canyon, that could be shared across collections that have specimens that were collected yeah. in. Strawberry Canyon, but um, yeah, some of these landscapes that are associated with um, sort of a no locality data are kind of getting dumped in, and shared um, by institutions. So we, we are working to clean that up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I encourage everyone to look at some of these links. Folks, um, Marion. Angie are putting out there to, to kind of look at um, resources and, and examples of um, linking out to different uh, external websites that host media. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, any questions or um, any other thoughts from the presenters you want to mention? Um. And again, we encourage people to, to look at the documentation. If anything's unclear um, or, you know, things change, I just updated the how to upload media to TAC yesterday because things do change. Um, so if things aren't working, definitely let us know. Yeah, and uh, please, I encourage everyone to just take our post-webinar survey. It takes literally one minute, and it gives us great feedback and also um, it's important for IDIG bio to just show um, attendance statistics and things like that. So if you could just take a moment and quickly fill that out, um, we'd really appreciate it. Oops, looks like we're getting a question from here. I just wanted to reinforce uh, the point that uh, Carla brought up that all media are public. So regardless of whether you associate your media with uh, private uh, records and accession or, or something else that you've encumbered, um, that media can be discovered through those other routes. So just keep that in mind as your, um, I, I think this is especially important for things like permits or um, accession information. We sometimes in our records have uh, personal information, things like social security numbers on, on receipts for items that have been purchased. You want to be really careful about that and make sure that you're redacting any kind of information that might actually um, endanger the privacy rights of individuals who contributed that media. So just a little, uh, little point in there. But we are, as Mariel says, yes, we're working on private media storage, possibly um, through TAC, that uh, will, will be password protected. So we will have some, some better options coming up in the future. All right, it looks like we don't have any other questions. So thank you so much to our presenters. That was really helpful. And hopefully everyone uh, learned more about media. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you. Oh, Thanks, Emily. Right. Thanks, everyone. Okay.
Bye. Bye.